Welcome to Business Conversations with your host, business strategist, Clive Enova. Clive is joined by expert guests as they talk business behind the scenes to give you the tools and insights to support your growth, security and serenity as you strive for your success. Welcome to another episode of Business Conversations with Clive Enova. I am Clive Enova, business strategist, and we're having a conversation with Hugh Thayer about the ultimate quote format. Hugh Thayer is an Australian direct response copywriter who works with clients to generate leads and sales. Over the past decade, he's helped people get more sales in dozens of industries, as varied as investing, health, education, phone systems, concreting, dental, and counselling. He's also pioneering the ultimate quote format, the process for getting more buyers and clients with the quotation they are sent. Hello, Hugh. Welcome to Business Conversations. Hello, Clive. It's nice to be here. Great to have you. And you've been busy working with all of these different industries, if you like. What have you noticed about all of these different industries when it comes to marketing and generating leads and sales? Something I notice is a lot of businesses want to generate more leads. And that's fair enough. You know, the more leads you get, the better chance you have of... um, getting more sales, but I've noticed that a lot of them, or the most successful ones tend to focus not on just getting leads, but they also focus on turning those leads into sales. So the ones that aren't very good at that, they tend to want more and more leads, whereas the ones that are the most successful have the best strike rate of turning those leads into actual paying customers. Indeed. So whilst they might still want more leads, they're actually making good use of those leads. Yeah, exactly. And look, getting leads is expensive. So whether you're getting leads on Facebook or Google or direct mail or whatever you're doing, look, it's going to cost you money. And if you're burning through those leads too quickly and you're not getting the results, then you know it's time to open up the bank account and, and get more of them. So the way I look at it and the way I see it pan out is a lot of businesses have like essentially a leaky bucket. So if they want to fill their bucket up and it's got lots of holes in it, they just pour more and more water into it. So what I do is I work with them not just on generating leads, but also making sure that they can close those leads more effectively. Essentially, we try and plug the holes in the bucket first and then we don't need to pour as much water in there. Indeed. So you're actually talking more directly to a better quality prospect. Well, it's not so much the quality of the prospect and you don't necessarily get to choose the quality of your prospects, although you can through the leads you're bringing in. It's more about doing the things to convert more of them into customers. So, and it depends, it varies a lot between industries, but, you know, for example, if you're going out to get an electrician, let's say, you might go out and get three quotes from electricians, you get the three prices, you know, you'll get a quick email, a text from these guys, and they'll have their price, and what do you do, Clive, what do you normally do? You choose the cheapest one, and that's, that's no good. So, essentially, what you end up with is you end up with a one in three chance of getting the sale you also end up in a race to the bottom because a lot of the time, you know, if you're not the cheapest, then you're not going to get the job. Racing to the bottom is is no way to run a business. You know, your margins get slashed. The work you do is lower quality. No one's happy. It's Look, it's no good and it's something people have got to stop doing. So what I'm focusing on with the ultimate quote format is a way of actually turning more leads into buyers and not focusing on price. So what we do is we essentially, we get a whole bunch of information to people at exactly that point when they're making the decision to buy. So, for example, and I'll take a bit of a diversion and tell you something else which you haven't covered yet, but it's relevant to this, is my wife and I actually have another business as well. So I don't just write sales copy. It's more her business than mine, but we produce acrylic splashbacks, which are essentially, look they look identical to glass splashbacks, but being acrylic, they're cheaper, lighter, you can cut them on site if you need to. We do quite a bit of work with do-it-yourself clients. And what we found going back about 12 months is we would send out a quote to them, just drop the price in an email, here's how much it's going to be, text message, phone call, whatever. Our close rates on those DIY clients was about 20%, which is pretty crummy. So what I did was I put my copywriting hat on and I put together a format that we would send to the customers We started using this format and our close rate went from 20% to 52%. So not everyone is going to buy. Some people just want a prize. They're just fishing around. They may delay their project. So getting a 52% close on 
for DIY clients is huge. It represented a 260% increase. And essentially where we would send out 10 quotes and get two jobs, we would send out 10 quotes and we now get five. So like, it's been a real breakthrough for us. We don't have to generate any more leads. We don't have to do any of that. We simply get in front of the customers with all the information they need to buy at that point that they're making the buying decision. And unfortunately, a lot of business owners overlook this opportunity. So they do all the work to generate the leads. They'll put all the, whether it's the Facebook together or the, the newspaper ads or the yellow pages, the, the beautiful websites, they'll go to networking events. They'll put all the effort into that. They'll get the leads in. And unfortunately, when it comes time to name the price, the wheels fall off. Yeah, all right. The point being, of course, that by providing the customer with the right, correct information mm-hmm. that they need at that point when they're ready to make the decision, chances are they'll make that decision in your favour. Exactly. Essentially, it's not a quote. So most people think of a quote as giving somebody a price. I don't think of giving a quote as giving somebody a price. Essentially, what you're sending them is you're sending them a sales letter. And that sales letter has all the information that they need to make that decision. Yeah, the, the quote because is regardless of price what they're buying, we, we form a, a list of criteria, whether we mm-hmm. actually formalise that or not. Mm-hmm. We have a list of criteria. And once that criteria is satisfied, we're in a position to move forward with a purchase. Yeah. Now, what happens if that buyer doesn't know that you actually satisfy that criteria? What if you haven't told them on the call? What if you've told them but everyone else has told them the same thing? What if you can reiterate that in writing so they can read it, they can see it? They definitely know it's it's true. I remember years ago I was looking for a, an MP3 player or something like that on eBay and there are all these MP3 players. Some of them would have like two or three lines of in a description of what they had and the other ones had like seven or eight lines. Well, you know which one I bought? I knew they were all the same. I knew they would all do the exact same thing but I went for the one where they actually confirmed what they did and they put it in writing and they, they told me. You know, that's why this is such a powerful device. And essentially they made you feel comfortable. They allowed you to feel comfortable that you were making a good decision. Yeah, I wasn't assuming anything. It was all there in front of me in black and white. There you go. So this is excellent because you're now starting to talk to people in the language that they want to hear from you from. Exactly. And it depends on what you're selling, but people have all sorts of criteria and, you know, the nice thing about this quote form is it's really cut and paste kind of stuff. It's the same thing that goes out to everybody. But once you've worked out exactly what they need to know and you get it all in there, you know, there'll be bits in there that aren't relevant to everybody, but you've got to cover all the bases because there could be one question or one objection that a buyer has that you can handle in that quote format. So really there's no limit to how long this thing can be. The one that we're using for our splashback business is 13 pages long. Now, I was chatting to someone recently who got some advice from a business advisor, and I think in some government-run small business program, who said that your quote should never be more than two pages long, ideally one. And I thought, what a load of rubbish. That's absolutely wrong. You know, your quote is not just, as I say, it's not about giving the price, it's about reselling the people at the time when they're making the decision, and that's the most critical time. Indeed, and the quote should be what the quote should be. Yes, and the price, when you do this correctly, becomes far less relevant because, as you know, people only buy on price when you give them no other criteria to choose. But there's a perception out there that people will always choose the cheapest, but they don't. So, for example, have you come across the Kia Picanto? doesn't ring a bell. It doesn't ring a bell. You've probably never seen it. You may see them occasionally on the roads but you will see a lot more Mercedes, BMWs, Alphas, Audis. So the Kia Picanto is, is literally the cheapest car you can buy in Australia. It's like 11 or 12 grand. So it's dirt cheap. And if everyone was buying on price, then our roads would be full of Kia Picantos, but they're not. So people have a lot more buying criteria. That's why people buy more expensive cars. So by taking the focus off price and by telling people about everything that you do, you can then effectively redirect them away from just wanting the cheapest price all the time. Indeed. It's amazing how we learn that once our criteria has begun to be satisfied, price is is really not, as you said, quite Mm -hmm. as relevant. Mm -hmm. So we can move past that when we're talking to people. We don't have to 
debate the price. Mm. No, no, look, exactly. And unfortunately, like it's, it's lovely to get everybody on the phone or in front of them when you're actually going through the sales process with them, but it's not always practical. You know, you'll talk to people on the phone at some point during the process or meet with them, but you can't do it all the time. And if there's, like I say, you've got 13 pages of information to give to somebody, they're not going to give you the time on the phone, but you can put it in front of them and they will read it. A lot of listeners might be thinking, that's just way too long. People won't read that. But the fact is they do. If they're interested, they'll read it. So there's always been a debate about whether long sales copy and long letters and long ads are better than short ones. But in my experience and in the collective experience of my industry, long always works better. The question some people ask is whether you should, um, whether your advertising be short or long and whether people want to read long ads or short ads. Well, people will always say, well, I'd rather read something short. But the reality is when they're making a buying decision and it's their money, they want to know everything that they can about the decision that they're making to make sure they're not going to make the wrong decision. People don't want to look stupid. They don't want to make a mistake. And That's, they don't want to lose money. And they don't want to lose money. So, exactly. mm. In coming up with this quote, mm-hmm. is there a particular criteria to the quote itself? so that you make sure you've covered off the right points regardless of the industry? Yes, there is. So when I do these quotes for people, I I go through a bit of a process to find out like everything about their business, what they offer, the kind of people that they're selling to, what are their buying criteria. And as you would know, the buying criteria for one person can be different to the buying criteria for another one. So The nice thing about this is we can make it longer if we need to. If there's something that we need to put in there, then we can. Essentially, once we come up with all that information, we can then put that into a format and we can retell the same information in a couple of different ways. And I'll go through that in a sec. But yeah, that's the criteria. Now, there's something to remember when you're putting something like this together is you're not just telling people what you do differently. You can tell people about what you do, which is the same as every other person in your industry. So I'll use the plumber, for example. Now, a plumber could use a certain type of pipe, which is earthquake-proof and bomb-proof and rat-proof and, yeah, it comes with a 50-year warranty and tree roots won't grow. And it's a certain type of pipe. I'm starting to like this piece of pipe. Yes, it is a good piece of pipe. (laughs) Odds are every single plumber uses it. Now, most plumbers would say, I don't need to tell people about that. Everyone uses the same pipe. It's just like what we use. But what if there's one plumber who says, I use this bit of pipe. It's this is the name of it. You know, it's bomb proof. It's earthquake proof. It's it's what it's, it's all those things, right? What if you actually put that in writing and say this is the type of pipe we use? What kind of impression do you think that leaves on the buyer compared to the other plumber who don't doesn't mention it at all? Just yeah, because we know what we're getting. We whereas with the other fellow, we suddenly don't know what we're getting. Don't know what you're getting. Wouldn't have a clue. So even though you do exactly the same thing as everybody else, this format gives you a huge competitive advantage without even having a competitive advantage in your business compared to your opposition. And not only does that allow you to get more jobs, you can use that to increase your prices as well because now people have that confidence and they have that trust and people don't want to look stupid, Clive. They don't want to make the wrong decision. That's a very big point that people should remember when they're selling to people. They need to be confident. The greatest fear of a person about to make a purchase. Am I making the right decision? Mm -hmm. Will will my friends and peers laugh at me? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we give them the confidence. And if they're worried about that, I'll tell you what, Clive, they'll read it. Very good. Now, you uh, got an excellent result using it for yourself 2.5 times. Yeah. uh, What you were doing previously, Mm -hmm. which is a great turnaround. Yep. And have you tried it in other industries and received similar results? Well, I haven't tried it in other industries yet. I've got some quotes out there and I'm still waiting to get some feedback from those. So I'm I'm currently writing one from a company who sells garages. I've just done it for a a company who does uh, investment properties. So they're rolling that out at the moment. I'm about to do another one for another company in a similar industry. Interesting thing, and I'll give you another example from this company who does the garage doors. Oh, sorry, the garages. So they'll sell like a kit and they'll go and assemble the garage. Now, their opposition is, has got a bit of an advantage over them because they just sell the kits and they say, 
go and get someone to put it all together for you. And they'll give them rough prices for how much it'll be to do the concreting and the assembling and all those things. What this guy has found is that most of the quotes for the services that are being given out to those clients are trade prices, not prices that the average person on the street would be paying. (laughs) So, of course, you know that's going to be going in the quote because we can now warn people about that. So when they're getting the pricings from this company and all the others, we've got that warning in there now so people actually know. So we can tell people all the information that they need to make that buying decision. Indeed. And again, that's providing people with information to allow them to make a good decision because there's nothing worse than having to explain to your your buddies and your peers that, well, I took their advice, which just happened to turn out to be wrong. Mm. Uh, I overpaid for my prices, garage. Not retail prices. Mm-hmm. Yep. Very frightening situation. So as you're moving towards uh, getting this quote out for anybody and everybody to use, what particular things have you discovered along the journey? Look, it's interesting because the discoveries weren't that great because I've been doing this for a long time. So I've been writing sales copy for years and I knew instinctively all the components that need to be in there. But a lot of people are discovering things as I explain it to them. One of those is telling people exactly what you do, regardless of whether or your opposition does that. In, in fact, there is an, another classic example of that is a company called Schlitz Beer from the 1930s. And I think it was Claude Hopkins, a famous copywriter from the time, who prepared some advertising for them and toured the factory and, and uncovered all these amazing things about the filtration process and where they dig up their water from, it's the bores that they use to collect the water, discovered all these amazing things and actually started to put that into the advertising and they went from number six in the market to number one. So what I've just discovered a long time ago but a lot of people aren't really aware of is the need to tell people as much that you can. Obviously keep it relevant, don't tell people things that just aren't going to be important to them but err on the side of telling people more instead of telling people less because as I think I mentioned before you don't know what's going to appeal to somebody. Yes there are all sorts of things that that people like to hear Mm -hmm. and as you said as long as it's relevant Mm -hmm. they want to know about it because if they know about it they then have something to compare everybody else to don't they? Yeah exactly. And in the end when you're buying even if they're buying on price it's still a comparison but as you pointed out earlier people will move away from just price provided they have their criteria uh, met. Yeah, exactly. And and imagine that you're about to hire a builder or an electrician or a plumber or, goodness me, a copywriter or a graphic designer or an accountant or a financial planner and you've got two emails from two companies which have got just like a bare bones price and you've got another one which has got a 10 or 15 page document explaining everything that they do, why they do it, how they do it. It's fairly obvious which one's going to give them the highest amount of confidence. We can make price very irrelevant very quickly. And, in fact, you can charge more. You can certainly increase your prices doing this as well. There's no reason that you can't. Yeah. So with an alternative business, alternative to yours, that is, Mm -hmm. using your ultimate quote format, Mm -hmm. what benefits are likely to be available to them? Look, at the end of the day, it comes back to very simple things. Number one is not needing as many leads because you're converting the the leads more. And number two is more sales because, you know, the more you convert, the more sales you're going to get. The other benefit, the third benefit actually, is that you can increase your prices as well. So generating leads is tough. In some businesses, there's only a limited number of people in the market at any time. So you don't want them to slip through your fingers and go to your position. Also, generating leads is not easy. It's tough out there, whether you're doing Facebook or something offline or Google, you know, you could do a whole bunch of SEO. That's expensive and time-consuming. Whatever you're doing costs money. Facebook costs a fortune to get leads. Google ads, fortune. Advertising and offline publications, it's a fortune. You get those leads in. It's not about getting more leads, which a lot of companies think it is. It's actually about doing more with the ones you get. Yeah, imagine if you could even a 10% increase in the number that you close. It's 10% extra profit you're making without having to spend a cent more on lead generation. And I'm not just talking about 10%. This done right, this quote format has done a 260% increase Mm. for our splashback business for DIY customers. So the results can be, you know, off the charts. 
That's right. That's quite phenomenal change. Mm. And you know, listeners should just think about, okay, what would happen to my business if I got two and a half times the result from the leads mm-hmm. that I generate? Yep. As you say, perhaps it's not about generating more leads. Perhaps it's just about making better use of the leads that you get. So what are the particular components that one needs in a quote? Well, the quote format that I've put together, there's four different components. So would you like me to run through through them all? Let's have a look at the whole lot. Okay, so the first component, well, of course, you introduce the quote, just fairly standard, you know, thank you for requesting a quote. And then you put the price in fairly high up. We have a bit of a blurb about our business and then we give them the actual quote. And then we go into the quote format, which supports the whole thing. The first component of the quote format, which supports the price, is X reasons to use us. So I mentioned this a minute ago that you've got to be looking for things that you do differently, but also things that you do the same that people might not be aware of. So what I'll do, I've actually got my quote format for that one in front of me. So let me give you some examples from that one. So X reasons to use you. I think we're up to nine or 10 reasons now. By the way, this is a living document. We come up with another reason. We come up with more proof elements or whatever. We put it in there. This thing is growing constantly. So X reasons to use you. So for example, reason number one for our splashbacks, significant cost savings over glass and it won't break like glass can. And then we just talk about that. You know, we talk about why it's some of the cost savings, how much you're likely to save, talk about the fact that it's easier to install, can't break and things like that. We then go through a whole bunch of other reasons in there. So like no grout, the the appearance, ease of installation. These are all reasons that you would use this product. So you've got to come up with all these reasons. Again, some of the things that we do here are things that any other splashback company, acrylic splashback company will do. Some of them aren't. Some of the things that are specific to us. Look at things like some of the price benefits, some of the ease of use benefits, the service that you provide as well as another one. So anything that sets you apart or anything that might set you apart in the mind of the person who's reading it, even though it's the same as it, like the example I gave before with the plumbers and their pipes, that should all go in there. And there's no real limit as long as you don't start getting stupid and nitpicking and things like that. They've got to be actual benefits that someone's going to go, oh, I like that. Our warranty, for example, is in there and level of service and ease of maintenance, all these things are in there because we know from talking to customers over the last few years, we know what's important to them. And if we know it's important to them and if it's part of the, the normal message that we give to people when we talk to them, it goes in here. So this will back up all the previous conversations we have with people. This backs up what's on our website. This backs up what's in our brochures. And so most first, importantly, it addresses what's top of their mind. What's, exactly, exactly. Because we can't get them on the phone to interrogate them to find out what's on their mind, we make sure it's all in there. So, for example, an electrician, like I say, you know, you might have the type of cable they use or a videographer might be the type of camera they use. It could be the same one that they all use, but, you know, you've gone and described it and you give people confidence, you know. The next component is that we put in there are frequently asked questions. Mm-hmm. So frequently asked questions are not, surprisingly, not just about answering common questions, although they are. It also gives you the opportunity to answer common objections that people may have. So if people... For example, an acrylic splashback, how does it go with scratchability versus glass? You can answer that. If people have objections about something else and your listeners will have learned this about their customers from all the conversations they've had, what are the objections? What do they need to know before they buy? They can go and frequently ask questions. That message will also be in the X reasons to use this as well. So effectively what we're doing in the frequently asked questions is we're answering the common questions, we're retelling some of the benefits that we spoke about in part one, and we're knocking out some of their objections as well, which brings us to the third component. Same kind of thing, but we're retelling the story in another way. So this is common mistakes people make when they deal with your industry. So common mistakes, again, you're telling people the same information. If your prices are higher, then one of the common mistakes will be paying for the cheapest and why that's not always a good thing. It's about educating your customers so that they know what to ask. So if they come back to you before they sign up, you've educated them as well through this whole process and they know exactly what to ask. And it's no longer about the price. And this is one of the other things about this format is you're actually, you're telling them how to buy. You're telling them the criteria that's important. So common mistakes, we're retelling them the same things in a different format. It also, we alluded to this before, or you did, Clive, 
with the example about the pipes, the plumber might be might tell people about these pipes that they use, which everybody else uses. Now you just introduce that little seed of doubt into people's minds that, well, what do the other plumbers do use? Do they use these pipes or not? You're not going to claim that they don't because that would be lying and that would be wrong, but you're entitled to tell people what you do. So common mistakes just allows you to also sow that seed of doubt and position you as definitely the company who can do everything that they want. So, for example, our common mistakes with our splashbacks, for example, might be picking a product based on price alone. You know, it's not the cheapest product in the market. Choosing a thinner splashback is another mistake that people could make and there are thinner alternatives on the market or choosing the wrong material. So, you know, we answer that. Again, you'll see in the first two components that we talk about all those things. So we're just telling the same story in a different way. Delivering the information so mm-hmm. that the customer has an opportunity to accept it in the way that they want to hear it or see it or read it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And some, depending on people's personality and the way they frame the world and the way they look at the world, some people may be more attracted to knowing about the mistakes because they may be nervous. Or what are the mistakes? What do I need to be careful of? Other people may be more attracted to the benefits. Other people may want to know, oh, what are the frequently asked questions? Is my, I've got questions. Are my questions in there? And, of course, after you've provided all of this information so a person does feel comfortable, you give them a, a comfortable method through which they can buy. Well, yeah, you do. But wait, there's more. There's well, a fourth there's, component, there's which I haven't covered yet. And the fourth component is our proof elements. Yep. So you don't just tell people, you prove it. And the more proof you have, the better. So, yeah, we've got probably two or three pages of our, um, of our quote just dedicated to testimonials. So we get testimonials from buyers. We get Google reviews. Someone leaves a positive message in a Google review. You can put that into the quote format. No reason you can't. You know, if if you've got video or audio reviews, you know, you can transcribe them. People should always be out there asking, asking for feedback, asking for testimonials, reviews. Google's great because it allows people just to go and quickly type in their review without having to put in an email and send it in or anything like that. Yeah, we've got around about 10 testimonies in the proposal and we'll probably put more in there because we've got tons that we aren't using, but, you know, we've got 10 in there at the moment. Another type of uh, proof element is a case study. And these are great if you don't have testimonies, but you've got success stories that you can rely on. You can write up a case study, generally before and after. You know, this was the problem the person had before. We came in, we solved it. This is the result they've got now. So case study is good as well. Stories, you can just tell the stories about that, but, you know, better to put them in a specific nice case study format. For our business, the photos are very important. So we've got about four pages of photos in there of a whole bunch of different types of jobs from commercial to DIY, all sorts of things. Around about 16 we've got in there. If it's not a business where photographs are important, like a service, like an accountant or a financial planner or somebody like that, you can put in key statistics. You know, like what are the average returns you get for your clients compared to industry average? How much money do you get back on people's tax returns? Things like that. So, you know, that's another good proof element. They're they're the big ones. There we go. And, of course, that, as I suggested earlier, that puts people in a place where they now Mm -hmm. are ready to make a decision. And, of course, if you follow it with a nice, easy format for them to make the purchase, Mm -hmm. you're in a good place. Yep. And then, of course, you wrap it all up. You've got your nice quote format now. The only thing that you need to do when you send out a quote is, is literally change the price. Yeah, you know, if there's a scope of works, you can drop that scope of works and the price into the quote format in the appropriate place. The rest of it goes out literally unchanged. So it can so. save a person in business an enormous amount of time as well rather than mm. trying to recreate something every time they do it. Oh, exactly, exactly. So we normally send them out as a PDF via email depending on, you know, if it was like a significantly high-priced purchase, like getting someone to build a house or something like that, there'd be an argument for sending it out in the mail as well. But typically for most businesses, a nice PDF document is fine. It's got all the information in there and the email that you send them, as you alluded to before, tell them what to do next. So you would put that in the quote as well, in that introduction bit, you know, have Please read through the quote. Please read through the information if you have any questions. How do you call? How do you get in touch with us? Email, phone, whatever methodologies you have for wanting people to respond. Attach it into an email. Again, tell them what to do next and send it off. And if you need to, hey, follow up with a phone call. 
Indeed. Vastly simplified way of doing things. Mm. And this has been a great conversation. Thank you, Hugh. But what's the best tip you have received from a business conversation? Well, there's one which I really resonates with me, and it's something that I try and keep in the forefront of my mind in everything I do. It's called the Eisenhower Matrix, and I don't know if you've come across this one. But basically, you look at the work that you've got on and you divide it up into things that are urgent and not urgent and important and not important. So all your tasks will fit into one of these categories. So the things that are urgent and important, they get done straight away. You know, an urgent customer job that needs to be attended to, for example. But then there's the things that are urgent and aren't aren't important, like keeping your, your workplace clean. You can allocate you get somebody else to do that, you know, get another company to come in and do it for you. They're not, you shouldn't be worrying about those things. Then you've got the things that are urgent but not important and they can be, you know, people wanting information that's not going to lead to a sale but they need it now. Those kinds of things, they're, they're annoying but you've got to deal with them. But the thing that normally gets dropped off the list far more than it should are things that are important but not urgent. And what you'll find is that for most businesses, all their marketing activities sit in there. So people are busy rushing around all day trying to get everything done, but they never focus on the things that are important but not urgent. If I don't put together a new Facebook ad campaign today, I can do it tomorrow. I can do it next week. If I don't go to a business networking event tonight, that's cool. There'll be another one coming up, whether it's sending out emails to your database, whether it's getting messages on social media, whether it's doing SEO. These are all the things that are important but they're not urgent. And this quote format is the same. It's something that people should really be putting together, but again, it's not urgent. So trying to rearrange what you do so you get the important stuff done, even if it's not urgent, is probably where the the greatest opportunity for, for your business growth lies. Now, another bit of advice, which is kind of relevant, is the need to treat everything with a sense of urgency. So a study or a number of studies have been done of our top performing CEOs and, and entrepreneurs and business owners. And the number one trait of the most successful people is that they treat everything, regardless of what it is, with a sense of urgency. So if people can deal with everything with a sense of urgency and get it done quicker, hey, look, it's going to open up the opportunity for you to have more time to actually do those longer term business growth type activities. Very good advice to have received. And What would be the top piece of advice, Hugh, for you to leave our listeners with today? Yeah, I think it's getting over the notion that people will want to deal on price, that there are ways that you can make price irrelevant. People want to deal with the people they trust. And the nice thing about the quote format is that we reiterate that at a point at which they need to know it. But yeah, the concept of um, needing to deal with racing to the bottom is a backward notion. And it doesn't work. And the outlook, if just off the top of my head, I just realised that then probably one of the other bits of advice would be not to focus on getting more leads. And most business owners want the phone to ring more often. They want more emails. They want more inquiries. But to look at what you're doing to convert those leads. Because if you can convert more leads without having to get more leads, your business will grow without having to spend any more money. So they, they'd be my the two top Indeed. bits of advice. And that's a very important thing for all of our listeners, if you've got leads coming in the front door and suddenly dropping off, we better find out why they're dropping off so that we can actually have more of them stay and turn into sales. Exactly, exactly. Most importantly, Hugh, how can our listeners connect with you to start their own business conversation? The best way to connect with me is through my website, which is www.com the ultimate quote format.com that's That's the the ultimate quote format.com there are no fancy symbols in the middle it's just the ultimate quote format all in one word all in one word yep dot com and if you go there then you people can click on contact and get in touch with me there is a live webinar which i run from time to time which people can register for and watch as well which has got a whole bunch of information Look, failing that people connect with me on LinkedIn or however they want to connect with me, they can email me, Hugh, at theultimatequoteformat.com. But look, that's a good place for people to go and get a little bit more information too. There we go. Great conversation on quoting and how to get the best out of your quote, Hugh. Thank you for turning up on Business Conversations with Clive Enneva. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to another episode of Business Conversations with Clive Enneva. 
Make sure you subscribe to future episodes via your favourite podcast app. And you can find more business resources at cliveenova.com.au.